morning. My name is Jackie Anderson, and I'm the Assistant Dean here at the University of St. Thomas, Opus College of Business. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our fall online learning series. Um, perhaps it should be called the Arctic Online Learning Series. Um, today is our last session in the fall series, um, and the title of the session is Strate Strategic Planning in the Exponential Era. Now, as you know, we've designed each one of these uh, sessions to let you start your day with a little dose of learning while giving us the opportunity to showcase some of the great faculty that teach with us here at the Opus College of Business. And I can promise you another great session today. Um, due to the great demand, we're going to launch a spring online learning series. And we'll have more details coming out via email in the near future. But we're going to kick off in January with Bob Eichinger, who's going to lead us through a session on neuroleadership. In March, Professor Nakisha Lewis will be joining us on multicultural marketing. And we're going to wrap up that series with Dan McLaughlin, who's going to talk about emerging trends in healthcare. So I can promise you another great session. Um, logistics for today are the same as they've been in the past. Um, we're going to spend about 40 minutes with our speaker presenting some key content around strategic planning in this uh, exponential era. And then we're going to reserve all the questions for the end. However, anytime during the session, feel free to use the chat feature and send our team uh, any questions you might have. And is typical, we'll send out the link to the recording. So if for any reason you're having technical difficulties, you'll still get the link in your email in the next few days. Um, and uh, finally, we always try to end about five minutes early. We know you might have a nine o'clock meeting. And so we will continue to try to honor that. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker. As I mentioned, the theme is strategic planning in the exponential era. Uh, Michael Wright is a global technology executive. He spent over 30 years in this space and a uh, majority of it in the C-suite, whether it was being a CEO or a COO or a board member. Um, he is currently a partner in a consulting firm uh, called uh, Intercepting Horizons. Uh, he's adjunct faculty here at the University of St. Thomas, as well as the Carlson School of Management. He's an avid skier and a great photographer. It's my pleasure to welcome today's guest, Michael Wright. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, good morning, and I hope everyone in the uh, cheap seats uh, can hear okay. Um, and if I mumble today, it's because my jaw's still frozen from the uh, temperatures outside. So bear with me. Uh, you know, it's a, a very uh, difficult task to ask uh, rhetorical questions, um, but let's start with, uh, in this type of an environment, let's start with one. Uh, how many of you think it's going faster and faster and faster? That things seem to be speeding up, right? Um, and you feel a little bit out of control because it's, it's moving so fast that you don't know quite what to do next. Well, today we're gonna explore why it's moving fast, where it's gonna go, and then possibly some ways that you might be able to address how do I catch it or get ahead of it even. So just as a way of looking at bias, um, what other people call a bio, my bias is largely technology. Um, it's largely around uh, things that move quickly and that interact uh, quite often. It's largely driven by technology and specifically high tech. So that gives us a world view and that always gives us a mindset and that's where bias has come from, so I'm sort of openly acknowledging mine. Uh, it is about technology, and it is about moving fast. I spent most of my career chasing something called Moore's Law. So one of the things that we have is we're at the beginning of a great reset. Uh, we face the task of understanding and governing with 21, 21st century uh, technologies, uh, 20th century mindset, right, and 19th century institutions. That provides us with somewhat of a conundrum. We have little time to solve that conundrum, and we have to reconcile two centuries of thinking and structures to a very fast moving time. So what you should get out of today is, well, why? Why do we need to look at a new set of planning uh, approaches? Because we're in an exponential area. What are we doing? Well, what we've been doing is using an agrarian-based planning method that no longer works, and I'll go into that detail in a moment. So a new method of planning is needed, and when is it needed now? Because as we'll find things move fast, we're in a new era that requires finding ways to develop and execute strategies 
to keep pace with that sense of where are we going and why are we going so fast? You know, the new is constantly evolving and moving fast and is the route to business survival. Right. So here's something to ponder. The difference between an opportunity and a threat is the time horizon in which you see it. If you see it far enough away, you can build infrastructure, you can be ready to deal with it. If it's upon you, run for your life. So it's very important to understand how to look at time and where time plays and all of the things that we do. So we know that traditional planning won't work. So think about words as the skin of a thought. The words that you use, the words that you pick, determine the direction of thinking that you take, where you go with your ideas. Right? So if we use words in planning like cash cows, harvest, seed, cultivate, grow, your mind gets stuck right, in an agrarian timeline. The challenge is that was all built around a circadian rhythm. Seasons, getting up in the morning, planting, harvesting, right? The problem is that we have created a linear quarter on quarter approach to planting. Next, the next, the next. And we have two crops, growth and shareholder value. Both of those are challenging us today. The growth side, it's limited. We have limited resources on the planet. And the shareholder value is coming under, I think, long overdue uh, scrutiny in terms of how do you drive and why do you drive businesses? What are businesses for? The other part of this is in an exponential era, we have machines that learn and they don't sleep. They don't care about the seasons. What they care about is what their next problem is. So we're at a point of departure in technology and it's gonna make catching up difficult at best. There are highs of the lines, the points of departures that all converge. There's things going on in technology and society and the environment and science and governance that are changing at exponential speeds and at volume. So let's start with exponential. And yes, it's about math and it's about time and it's about complexity and speed and flash change. Exponential means volume at velocity. So let's take a look at what that does. There are three kinds of people out there. Right? There's those that understand math and those that don't. And for those of you that have a little bit difficult time of making that equation work, the uh, presentation will be available and you can ponder it at leisure. But essentially, for those of you that are struggling to muster a smile, let's just say that exponential is multiplication involving power laws with a dramatic ending. Things move quickly and then all of a sudden, where do we go here? All right. So this takes a look at filling a Lake Superior or Lake Michigan to the same level as the number of brain uh, activities in your brain. So if you look at doubling it every um, every year, this is how long it takes to fill the lake. This is a classic example. Oops, it's not doing it. It's a classic example of exponential. You see nothing and nothing, and then all of a sudden, towards the end, as we get closer and closer, oops, there it goes, bang. That's what happens with exponential. So exponential laws are very interesting. This is Moore's law, and it's one of the things that's been driving our technologies for nearly 50 years now. When I started in this business, it was one micron. We are now at seven nanometers. That's a huge change in both density and computing power, and they are interrelated. Here's an example. This is the IBM model 350 disk file with a storage space of five meg. Now that's less than your camera has in one picture, your, your phone today, right? The one on the right is basically the little disc that goes in sort of a regular camera or other devices. It's 128 gigabytes, right? Now that is a 25,000, 600 to one, 25,600 to one. So that's considerable. 
if you want to put it in some other perspective, let's take an uh, let's take the uh, square miles of, of Florida, 65.8 million square miles, and we would reduce it to 2.6 square miles. That's the order of magnitude. If we took um, seven TCF football fields, we'd reduce them to the size of a quarter. That's what's happened over the last 50 years with Moore's Law and exponential change. So if we plot that and we take a look at computing speed on a linear scale, and we look at Moore's Law intersecting that, and we look at processing density and speed, you can see that we're at a very interesting point in time where computing power is about to really erupt. And you see it with AI, quantum computing, all those things. So as the, you think about exponential, it goes in two directions, right? There's a side that says we're gonna get smaller, 25,000 plus to one. Then there's another side that says the corollary is that computing power is gonna go up by a similar amount. That's huge. That changes the entire world. We can get an idea of that. Here's 1965, the computer, a dumb terminal, right? Stuck to your desk. Uh, very, very slow, although back then it seemed very, very fast. And you might even think of it as almost analog. On the right, you're seeing what we have today. One is analog, basically, or dumb terminals. The other one's everything at your fingertips. So call it a change it is an understatement and a disservice to all this gray hair. Because um, in less than three generations, it's moved from your desk to your lap, to your hands, and eventually, well, not eventually, to your brain. Two years ago, if you look up on YouTube, Rod Rodrigo Mendez driving a Formula One car just by thinking. He's a quadriplegic. Very interesting, right? So there was somebody that once said, uh, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. So many of these things that we've been talking about over the years, oh, implants, all that, well, we're actually doing them. So like I say, take a look at that YouTube video. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. So no remote control and only some with color on the left. Now we're moving to optical controls and embedded wall panels. Walk in, look at the screen, turn it on, make a couple movements with your eyes and it'll go to whatever channel you want, talk to it, and it might put up whatever you want to see. And I would have shown virtual reality, but it's not in every home yet. These are. Uh, only if you had one of these in your house um, do you feel the need to add the word cell in front of phone. Right. And it's a platform for life, not just a communications tool. In 1996, Nokia looked at the cell phone and said, basically, this could be the remote control for life. They were right. They just happened to miss the inflection points on the curves. And understand what the adoption rates might look like. This is mobile home versus fixed home landline telephone subscriptions in the United Kingdom. And what I want you to look at is the shape of the curves that you see. The adoption rate for landlines is very slow, very steady, but again, on a nice, you know, incremental growth curve. Now take a look at the red line, which is the adoption of mobile phones. That gives you a real good example of exponential adoption rates. And that's what we're dealing with. When Microsoft does an upgrade, it does an upgrade on a local level, tests it out, debugs it, and then rolls it out to literally hundreds of millions of users overnight. So adoption rates are very, very critical in an exponential era. What took nearly 80 years for the landline took less than 10 years for mobile. And those are the kinds of uh, contrasts that we're looking at. Here we have a classic analog versus di digital. And this is a great example of what we call the convergence of technologies creating a new ecosystem and disrupting the old. Right? We have an entirely new way of processing pictures, storing pictures, handling pictures, charging for pictures, paying for pictures. Right? And so when you have a convergence of technologies, the convergence becomes an accelerant. It changes an ecosystem and accelerates the change or the disruption. 
So speaking of exponential adoption rates in new ecosystems, Instagram went from f roughly 50 million to 1 billion users in five and a half years. So this stuff happens fast. So the point of driving home the exponential uh, piece of this is it is the era we're in. It is how things are changing and how do you start to think about and change with it or change ahead of it. So exponential adoption technologies uh, changes where and how we experience life. Um, I think his generation probably won't be rejecting implants. They're likely to embrace it. So remember thinking uh, about exponential. When you shrink things, you increase the horsepower, they go hand in hand. So here's an example of microprocessor clock speed. So this is just another view of computing horsepower, and it's the reflection of the corollary to Moore's law. What's happening here is this particular curve is enabling industries and completely remaking old ones. It's interesting here in games. For most of mankind's history, we've been limited in our games by physical space what we can do, where we can do it, play with, you know, and trust me, I love uh, things like Monopoly. They're still great games. But we were limited by where we could play, who we could play with, right, whether we could get to the game or not, uh, all those things. You had to be in the same room, you had to be on the same field or in the same stadium. Now you can literally play with the whole world. So that's how some of these things have changed our world. Some would say for the better, some for the worst. But there is an avenue of this that's very important, I think, to realize. If you go back to the Gutenberg Press, right, it changed the amount of information that was available to people. Today, we have synchronous communication. That's never happened in history. So a lot of people are wondering, what are we going to do with that? And I don't know that we have the answer yet but it's a very interesting thing to, to think about as you're building businesses. The ability to reach literally the whole world with an idea or a product in fairly short order because of synchronous communications. So in less than a decade, we've redefined what it is to be human and play games. What's interesting is that doesn't look like it's gonna go away. The capital markets are adding resources to machine learning at a doubling rate every three and a half months. They're accelerating that curve. It's like pouring gasoline on the fire. These are capital inflection points and you've heard people talk about unicorns and uh, that sort of thing in the, in the business space. And it's really adding capital at the point where you can drive up the exponential curve. Don't think it's gonna go away. And oh, by the way, think in terms of having algorithms on demand within five years. The ability to just pick the particular algorithm that fits your application or your desire uh, to build something and get it on demand. The other thing that's gonna be interesting is as we look at the internet of everything and all these different uh, devices out there that are gonna be able to talk, they'll also be able to talk to each other which gets even more interesting because connectivity enables exponential growth and the intercepting horizons become additive. They begin to build one on top of the other on top of the other. And that goes quick, which means things that when we connect them will become even smarter and they'll get smarter faster. You can even test ride today Think about the ramifications for cities and street design. Do you need wider bus lanes or no bus lanes at all? Do you need parking ramps or do you need queuing stations? The exponential era is changing our lives, our business and our economy and how society functions. So as you think about when you're building a plan, there's a great saying that we used to use and I've used throughout my career. It says, do you know what you do does? Do you know what you do does? When you make a commitment to a plan, you come up with a solution, you make a decision, do you know how that's gonna ramify? Because here we have technologies that are getting way ahead of us and ramifying 
whole design patterns. I was fortunate last night to be with two local mayors and their concern are things like, we're doing our planning. Do we plan for bus lanes, quite literally? Or with autonomous vehicles, personalized delivery systems, think of Uber and driverless, transportation on demand. Do you think about building bus lanes over the next 10 years? If you're in business and you look at trends, so here's an example of top 10 luxury cars in the USA. And look who's at the top there. In January to September, literally by tens of thousands blew away the competition. That was Tesla. There's another exponential adoption curve. It gets very interesting because you can bet that electric cars will be flooding the market within five years. You have commitments by people like Volkswagen, BMW, and others saying that, yeah, we're all going to go electric and all electric. Well, at first you go, oh, they're wonderful. They love the environment. No, take a look at the chart. The numbers tell you, the adoption rate tells you it's an exponential era and you better get on board. The other thing comes with that exponential era and all the different things that we have running around, the IoT, vehicles, lots of data being developed. AI loves data, Watson loves data, right? Increasing information about everything we do, everywhere we go. Data is the new oil, and the number of oil rigs is also gonna grow exponentially. Um, this is a pretty good picture for you to take away and think about in terms of what does exponential really look like, right? In the 1900s, it took a century to double the amount of knowledge of mankind. What IBM's telling us is that by 2020, next year, we'll be doing it every 11 to 12 hours. The AI machines will have plenty to feed on. The good news is for us, as they feed on it, things get better, potentially. Here's the cost to sequence a, a, a full human genome. So think about what that's gonna mean about 2030, being able to walk into your doctor's office, a swab and a complete diagnosis and a tailored approach to how you receive medicine. Again, the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Uh, hopefully some of us will be in line to get that sort of treatment. But you get the idea. It's gonna be tailored wellness at your fingertips and it's moving fast. What does that mean for you when you're in business? And why is exponential growth disruptive? Sometimes it's obvious, well, it goes so fast. But if you're sitting there on an agrarian planning cycle, and you're going, wow, we're pretty happy with 10% year over year growth, it's marvelous. It's, it's, you know, within a couple of years, well, actually seven will be double. Um, within about 15, we'll be at 80 million. That's still a nice growth curve. And by the time one full career cycle goes through, we'll be at 160. Unfortunately, the people that are using technologies to grow at exponential rates are doubling every two years. And so that says that, hmm, two years, they're where you're going to be in seven. Four years, they're going to be where you're going to be in 15. And in eight years, they just picked up 20 years advantage on you. So that's what disruption, where it comes from. And here's what it looks like. The granddaddy of disruption, Amazon, has used the convergence of technologies to transform and disrupt the whole concept of retail and direct to consumer services. If you look carefully at this chart, particularly the first 10 years, it is a classic example of missing an exponential pattern. Nothing seems to happen the lake doesn't seem to fill. It fills slowly over time. And then all of a sudden, away it goes. And they continue to go faster. Look at the distance in the last legs of that growth chart and the distance that they've grown upwards. So on the uh, horizontal side, they've really you know, uh, grown you know, in that same time period very high on the vertical side. So the Amazon lake is just beginning to fill. What happens when that happens? These are some brands you may recognize depending on your age and where you uh, spend most of your time. 
But a lot of us recognize these brands. They were around a long time. They were early pioneers in many of the areas that you see up there, Blockbuster, et cetera. What happened? Well, let's take an example of what happened. Um, in the first place, these guys are gone. What happened? Well, let's take an example of converging technologies and how it might impact an industry. Let's take 3D printing and autonomous vehicles. Let's put 3D printing inside the autonomous vehicles. What happens to logistics? All of a sudden, it's on demand. Parts are on demand. Uh, you can tailor the different autonomous vehicles by size, by what's inside of them, by what industries they support. Think of all the things that we use that are disposables. You do an online request or you even upload a design over 5G. And the next morning, there it is. Now it's interesting, one of the things that we do as a company is we have some relationships with people uh, that are using AI to look at the US Patent Office. You do a deep dive on that, and you all of a sudden see that if you take that same little thing, which we did, and we looked at 3D printing and autonomous vehicles, and guess who the players are that are already there, have already done the research, have already filed the patents, Amazon, Walmart, Ford. Right? What are they thinking about? How they're taking positions ahead of that curve. So it's about when you see things and when you act on them that becomes important. So what do they all have in common? They've joined the ranks basically of what we call flash boiled frogs. The old story about how do you, you know, cook a frog, you turn up the heat slowly, it gets tired and you cook them. In today's world, it's a flash. It's coming and you're done. Here's an example. Newspapers, the advertising revenue adjusted for inflation from 1950 to 2012, roughly $70 billion at its peak. Can you imagine being in the boardroom in the late 90s, close to early 2000s? Craigslist has just started. Remember that little slow curve that's coming. And you're sitting there going, it's great. The future's great. Look at that curve. It's going to grow. Sales are, we're going we're to have all-time sales highs. And then all of a sudden, the curve hits. Craigslist takes off. A new domain's created, a new ecosystem. The red line that you see there is what the newspapers did to try and catch by getting in the same business. Didn't work. The domain's gone. It's owned by somebody else. It's a new ecosystem. So let's take a look at another group. Taxis. And the other brands there are, are recognizable, I'm sure. So I'm going to ask you a question. How long do you think it took Uber to eat 40% of the taxi market? If you're planning cycles a year, keep that in mind. So you're in your first board meeting and this little company called Uber comes up and they take about 10% of the market. And your response internally is, well, let's watch them. That's interesting. I don't know what this other stuff is. You know, my kids use it, but I don't. So you can kind of hear the dialogue. The problem is you ran out of time. That's 15 months. It took 15 months to lose 40% of your market. If you were still on an agrarian planning cycle and mindset, by the time you got to the third quarter, you might have been running for the door because it happened quickly. And I guess that's the point. Uh, in this cycle and planning, you have to ask yourself, would your planning process have identified what was important and caused you to jump in time for you to survive. So what does your planning process look like? Is it agrarian? Is it an annual plan? Is it a three-year lookout? Are you planting and harvesting, using seed, um, cultivating? If those are the words that you're using, um, changes in market direction in volume and velocity may catch you by surprise and possibly make you a frog. The other things that it has to look at and you have to ask yourself is, did it include the convergence of horizons? Because these are the things that are coming out. The catalysts in these exponential times are the speed and scale of innovation, the emergence of new general purpose technologies, like the cloud, 
the progression of biotechnology, the societal impact of these advances, and the unintended consequences that are likely to be spawned. As all these come together, they get very complex. It's a small uh, piece of this, but a very important piece to mention is something called ethics. Character, ethics, and trust are probably three of the biggest words that have been missing in our uh, conversation around technology for quite some time. And that's a challenge. Today, we have ethics that are built around observable behaviors. You did that, that was wrong, we can observe it. And our ethics are built around that. The problem with technology is when we launch it, we have no idea how it's gonna ramify. So it's another thing to keep in mind. Do you know what you do does? So I wanna give a shout out to uh, Frank Deanna of Tata um, Consulting. Um, tremendous uh, visual here that uh, has a lot in it. I won't go into it, but fortunately you'll be getting it in your package. But this just takes a look at the science and technologies and societal factors. And when you start to converge them, what sort of future scenarios might develop? So we have things like the smart grid, right? Education, you know, 4.0. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution. You can put a lot of different things to it. But the point being is this, this represents a very complex and uncertain future, right? And it's filled with the unexpected. But visible on the horizon if you're looking for it. If you can look for the things that might impact your business or the markets that you're in and how you might deal with how these things converge, then you're probably on a pretty good planning cycle or planning process. How we deal with the future will force us to explore, again, these three things. Ethics, trust, and character. They become the overriding decision um, framework, if you will, uh, for what we do next in, in technology and, and how we do it in an exponential era. So here's a kind of an eye test chart for me back here, but um, here's how to look at an exponential curve. On the left, you see um, a couple of different technologies. So you have um, sort of a technology A, B, C. When you converge the two of them, you get a new one, C. When you put them with D and E, you get a new one, F. The thing that you're looking for is when those start to develop, you want to know when that convergence is going to create a new ecosystem with its own exponential curve. So the questions you're asking are, you know, what is the timing? When do we, are we going to see it? And what are the probable adoption rates? Because remember, those adoption rates are very, very fast. Doesn't take long to upgrade. Doesn't take long to accept cell phones. Doesn't take long to do a lot of things. If you miss the inflection point, you have to accelerate your effort to catch up. So it's very important. A lot of people think in terms of inflection as being that knee. Actually, the inflection is the point of liftoff. The inflection is this piece not this piece. When you get to this piece, you're at the turning point. You're at the knee, right? You're at the apex of the curve, as they say in racing. The problem is, once you go past the knee, you're now, your next step is basically the point of no return. You're not going to catch. You don't have the energy, the money to catch that type of change. So it's very, very important to have sort of an uh, awareness of where those horizons are, where they might lift, and when they might lift. So let's talk about planning in an exponential era and what it has to be. It has to be executable. It's great to talk about it, but you've got to be able to do something. It has to be dynamic. It has to be able to adjust to the variables. When you start to mix complex things, they have a tendency to wander in different directions, right? Make changes. Uh, we use words like pivot, uh, which just basically means you didn't see far enough ahead and now you're in trouble. But um, the other part of that is, is learning to make adjustments along the way. So the future is being built out of the dynamics of presently known and discoverable horizons or points of departure. If you go back to that chart that had all the different things converging, we know where most of it is. We know what most of it is. AI, quantum computing, flexible cloud um, data uh, storage, IoT. Um, these are things that we are aware of. The question is, where are they? What's their size? What impact do they have? Um, when and where do they change over time? At what speed are they moving? 
what's the duration and shape of the new ecosystems and windows of opportunity that they create? How many are important and which ones are pivotal? So basically we're dealing with a world of complexity operating at scale and speed. It requires an understanding of the intersections between multiple structures, networks, horizons, and time. And if that sounds overwhelming, it potentially is. So what you have to do is sort of parse it out, have a way of looking at it, uh, and, and then sort of have a process that allows you to sort of change on the dime, if you will. So we have to see the horizons and their convergence in time, and you have to change your plans in time. So you have this complex, fast, unrelenting, and unforgiving trend line. You've got to be able to respond quickly to it. The question is, how do you do that? So one way you do it is through what we call SPX, Agile SPX. So this is sort of a process view. And again, this is one approach. There are multiple approaches out there. This one just happens to build on sort of the scrum theory of, of team building and, and project management and sort of takes it to another level and pushes it up into the strategic planning cycle. One of the challenges that you have, and right at the very top, is it says cultural and behavioral change. If you're stuck with words that are agrarian based, your culture by definition starts to act that way. So part of it's changing the language and changing the behaviors. And that has to be recognized up front and quickly. And a lot of people start to resist, oh, well, we'll just keep our same planning methodology. Um, we're comfortable with it. It's you know, worked for 100 years. Um, of course, they forget that 100 years ago, it took 100 years for information to double, and now it's in the hours. But that's OK. We'll still use that. But the, the challenge is, if we are scanning the horizon, it sometimes feels like we're looking for uh, UFOs and extraterrestrials. You know, what's out there, and especially in boardrooms, et cetera, where you're trying to, you know, hey, we got to go take a look at this. Oh, it's a long ways away. Our point being, and what we tried to develop so far in the presentation is, it's not far away. And when it happens, it happens quickly. And the management needs to be engaged and be able to embrace change. A lot of it at speed. So we look at a horizon assessment, try to look out there and see what's out there, then come up with a priority list. Which ones are the most important to us? then come up with some project planning and implementation and try to do a series of experiments. And we want to be data driven in our results. So let's take a look what that might look like. Whoops. So here's an example of a framework, right? So this is an agile strategic intent framework where we're looking at leveraging scope, scale, and competencies. So if you wanna grow, you have to ask yourself, what do we have to put on the scale side? What do we have to put in place in the way of capabilities? If we wanted to grow in scope, we have to ask the same question on the scope side. What capabilities do we have to have to grow our scope? The other thing you have to look at is what's the timing of that? So what do you need to have, All right? What do you need to know and where are you going to play? What happens then is we look at out in the future, how is that going to change? Because there's this wonderful timeline that's running through everything that says, ah, and when will we intercept the future? So what are we gonna have to have in place in order to grow our scope, in order to grow our scale, and when are we gonna have to have it there? It's all about time. So planning in an exponential era requires understanding timing risk. What matters is not, it's not just what kind of threat a business faces or its size and consequences, but when. When's it going to happen is very important. A blizzard sometime in the next two years is one thing, or next two months, or next two weeks. However, a 50 mile an hour, zero visibility blizzard in the next two days is something else. And you would change your plan accordingly. So the time horizon in which you see things is very, very important. And when it comes to planning and survival, time is part of the critical path. We've been fortunate to get to know uh, Dr. Stuart Albert, who's been studying time for about 30 years. He wrote a very interesting book called Win. 
if you do a timing analysis and you can do it correctly, and we'll show you a little bit of how to do it, but you see connections you didn't see before. When we talk to a particular logistics company about that 3D printing and autonomous vehicles, and then we did the patent search, so we had the data, um, it's not clear that they completely understood what we were talking about because the question they come back with is when. When is that going to happen? So you have to do a timing analysis to look at the complexity and simplify it, clarify the uncertainty, define what you know and what you don't know, what you need to keep track of. Uh, and then you need to know what do you want to do when. So you have to predict when the significant risks might emerge and how fast and how early you need to be ready as well as when and how to take advantage of time sensitive opportunities. So I'll stop for just a second and give you an example out of the semiconductor industry. In Moore's law, you're doubling the computing power every two years. You're also shrinking the device. As you come down that device shrink curve, you have to be able to invent things. Invention is in your path. When you go from something that's this size to 25,600 times smaller in 50 years or less, there's a lot of invention in your path. And sometimes you had to start out 10, 15 years in advance in order to intercept that node. You knew it was out there, you knew it was gonna happen, but you had to start planning for it. <clears throat> so these horizons vary on their time length, but you have to know about when you have to be ready uh, to intercept them. So here's a look at that. What we're looking for is how technologies that will converge are moving through the lenses of timing. So here we're trying to anticipate when a new ecosystem might engage at speed and volume so I can, we can identify and prepare for it. So if you look at the inflection window, that moment of liftoff, it's when all those things line up. When they're available or pervasive or readily manufacturable or whatever other constraint you wanna to put to them, when they're there, that's when that window opens. That new ecosystem starts to develop. Once it's there, right, you've gotta get moving. Ideally, you would have seen it way back when, right? In the early stages and say, ah, oh, this is developing, this is developing. If those come together, what might happen? Let's monitor and track that. As we track it, we can start to see, well, hmm, the pace of what they're doing and how they're doing and applying the lenses to it, right? So these are all the things that uh, uh, Dr. Albert's been able to show that you can do with time. It has a rate, right? It has punctuations, it has sequence, it has shape. Uh, it has a number of things so that you look at time from a different point of view and you look at how technologies move through time. Take a look at doing an adjustment and obviously being in place for the turning point so that you don't end up in the point of no return. That takes a change in behaviors, as we said before. And one of the things I like to leave you with as well is performance is the residual of behaviors. I'll say it again, performance is the residual of behaviors. If you focus on just behaviors, you end up right, with the right performance. If you focus on just performance, you allow behaviors to be the variable. If you want to see how that works out, think in terms of Enron and others like them. A singular focus on performance allows the behaviors to vary. The last thing you want in an organization is variable behaviors. So part of that is changing the words and the focus, and the words of the focus in this particular one are looking at the agrarian concepts of profit, eliminating risk, stability, standardization, linear thought process versus an agile approach, which is value creation embracing risk, adaptability, personalized, right? Bringing it to the individual, and then it's exponential. So you have to look at changing the structure and the mindset, uh, and that requires a cultural change. So that is probably the biggest uh, challenge that you'll have in changing your uh, methodologies. The next one is what management has to endorse, support, champion, lead, get engaged, and get out of the mind, agrarian mindset, obviously, but you have to be a metrics-driven organization. You have to look at data closely, a high degree of experimentation, generate new ideas, basically have an innovation factory. Make decisions fast, you can recover fast. 
anticipate horizon convergences. Where are they coming? When are they coming? And the other thing that's different is hit the exponential inflection window. You want to look at a project planning and implementation, agile methodologies. Agile methodologies that have been used in software for years are short duration, small teams, high organizational involvement, interactive frequent communications, all the things that are very difficult to do in large organizations and are especially difficult to do if you're going to make a plan and put it on a bookshelf and refer to it on a quarterly basis. Inflection windows versus gap analysis are probably the two biggest things that we see in the difference between the planning systems. We have the, the agrarian side of, well, we're going to plant this and we're going to harvest that. That's essentially what a gap analysis is. We're here and we want to be here over the season. So it's all about timing. It's all about changing priorities based on the speed of the horizon's convergence and finding those windows and being prepared for them. And one of the things is to get the data and time enrich it. When you look at the data that you're collecting and you're using that to drive your teams, the data has to have a time element to it. That's sort of important. So this is for the, uh, the accountants and uh, for the engineers in the audience uh, that like comparison charts and best of breed analysis and all that sort of thing. So here's a, a way of looking at uh, sort of the traditional versus uh, what we call agile. The first ones that are not highlighted are basically sort of incremental, things that you just sort of have to change on a functional basis. The ones that I've highlighted there in red and blue are absolutely new and different. If you look at timing risk, it's not typically considered. The people that were in the taxi business were not looking at the timing risk to them of Uber's adoption. You have to have multiple lenses, which you, multiple lenses that you look through to understand what's happening on a time-related basis to the technologies. Response to uncertainty. We usually end up in analysis paralysis. Oh, I didn't go to plan. What do we do now? How do we deal with this? What's next? Uh, who's got an idea? In Agile SPX, you want to use experimentation. Constantly looking at how do we change, what did we learn, add it to the next iteration, and keep moving. And on the implementation side is typically large initiatives. Well, we're going to do this, we're going to grow a factory, we're going to put it here, we're going to put it there. On the Agile side, it's high velocity iterative execution. You're doing lots of them in parallel at high speed. And the requirements definition, like we said, gap analysis versus inflection windows. So what does that look like? Well, this is one approach. <clears throat> it's ours, of course, but it's just another way of, of trying to get at this exponential era and being on top of the changes and not being left behind at the uh, points of uh, departure. So you start with something called identify and monitor the horizons. That's using research, things like predictive analytics, timing analysis, and looking at the US Patent Office and seeing where people are putting their research. Um, simple things. Then you want to generate some ideas the classic diverge, converge. Uh, many of you have experienced that. And then the real trick is probably here, the short experiments. When Microsoft launches an upgrade or a product, they typically take a small area or small group of customers, run the test, do the uh, challenges to the, uh, the software, and then launch. If you look at the other side, we come up the other side, we're gonna observe what happened I'm going to make some changes to it and then try uh, to see if it's scalable. Once we understand that we have something that works, just like that upgrade, we turn around and we roll it out on a very high volume at speed, better known as an exponential era and an exponential plan. I thank you very much. I have some takeaways for you. Um, one of them is that language counts. I think we've emphasized that. The other one is that timing is, oops, is critical. Um, digital transformation takes place at the convergence of emerging technologies. It's very important to understand that. Research, researching those convergences we think is critical. If you miss the inflection point, you don't have much time to determine if it's a threat over an opportunity. More than likely, if you've hit that apex, it's probably a threat. Uh, there are planning solutions available. Ours is just one. Um, but they have to be implemented at speed. 
you can't leave it on the shelf. You can't be revisiting it. You have to have a number of experiments going simultaneously. And volume at velocity spares no one. Thank you kindly for your attention. Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, fascinating. Uh, we've got several questions, and again, I'm going to try to honor our five-minute rule. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you a couple Please. questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is, how do I discover potential technology changes that may impact my business? Okay, there's a number of things. One is, like we said, there's the, the patent office and looking at what are the trends and technologies. Today, one of the other things that you have at your fingertips are things like academia. It's a research uh, site. Uh, you have Deep Dive. Uh, which is spelled D-Y-V-E, Deep Dive, um, has, I think, about 15 million uh, articles now uh, uh, curated. And go in by topic area and look. Uh, you also have probably the best source always is your customer. What are they doing? Why are they doing it? How are they doing it? If you ask them simple questions like, what would you like to have? Um, you might get a pretty good answer. The other is to observe how they do things. How are they changing? So as an example, for those of you that are in the academic world, you know today that if you try to get a cohort together, it's unlikely they're going to physically meet. In fact, in class, they'll sit there and text to each other. Right? So I think it's lo looking for those areas of how do I see the trends? What are people doing? What is my customer doing? What is my customer trying to do? What problem is the customer trying to solve? Great. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question is, how would you describe the difference between knowledge and information? Good question. Knowledge uh, probably takes the added factor of people. Right? Information is data, zeros and ones. Right? I can take the data, I can write algorithms, and I can get some more data. But it takes people to add the knowledge piece, the sort of the wisdom, the, well, what does that mean? What is that relationship? How do we derive it? And even though we've got AI now playing card games and able to sort of intuit, that's using neural networks, it's still a fixed algorithm. All right. Number three, where does this fit in my planning process? It better fit tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but where it fits is as early in the cycle as possible. Um, and start to think in terms of planning being a continuous process. Uh, once these things start to, to generate or, or take off or start to go up those curves, you don't have time to sort of step back. You should have been involved or, or going along with it. I'll give you another example from the semiconductor industry. It took 12 years to go from 200 millimeter wafers to 300 millimeter wafers. If you weren't started in that early stage, 10, 12 years earlier, you weren't ready when the industry was ready. Great, and if you got time, I got a couple more. Okay. Um, if you spend all your time planning, how do I get anything done? Uh, that's sort of like asking me if I spend all my time breathing, right? How do I learn to swim? I, I think the, the, the challenge that you have from a timing standpoint is this is one of those that you have to carve out. You have to say this is, if I get behind, I, I will never catch up. Therefore, I'm going to have to put the time in. The problem that we have is we've taken big blocks of time in our strategic planning processes normally, put it aside, shut down the entire organization, get going on it, and then come back. So it's a huge disruptor. So when you say planning, most people, eh, I don't want to plan. I don't have time. I don't have time. Why? Because in, the, in historical times, we've actually spent too much time on the planning process rather than making a continuous iterative process. So it's just part of what we do. I have some uh, friends that run an engineering company that for years, every Thursday morning, they've gotten together for two hours and they talk about the future. That's the rules of the, the conversation. They're one of the best sensor um, builders in the, in the country. Very good, very good. Um, how do we measure time we in, when we are actually inside of time? <laughs> uh, that's for the uh, physicists in the world. Um, <laughs> it's a very good question, though, because if, if you're at this point and you're trying to observe something in the future, how do you actually put yourself in the future, right? Yeah. And it's very interesting. There's some uh, fMRI studies of the human brain that say we don't like to do that. Um, our brains like to be occupied on an energy level of um, – 
gee, you're a, you got to breathe. You got to be aware of everything. Is somebody coming through that door that's going to attack me? Uh, what's happening over here? Your brain wants to spend all of its time um, basically on your survival. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like looking at the future. In fact, the MR, MRI scans suggest that it's a person you don't really even want to know. It's like somebody, oh yeah, I met you, but you know, get away from me. So we also have that sort of rooted piece in our primal brain that says, we don't like to look at time. Mm -hmm. We like to look at now. So it makes it very difficult to, when you're within the now, how do I look at time, step back from it and look at it as a future element? Very good, very good. I see we're getting close to the bewitching hour, so I'm gonna draw together today's session. I wanna thank Michael Wright for joining okay. us today. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us in 2019, and we look forward to the launch of our spring online learning series in 2020, and more information will be coming out in the near future. So thanks again from St. Thomas. We hope to see you next year.